change. I'm Andy Taylor, planning manager of the regional planning team here at Dr. Cog. Um, I truly want to thank you for joining us for this online MetroVision Idea Exchange. Um, I've just got a couple of announcements before we get today today's presentation. Uh, please note that um, we have reserved time at the end of the session for Q&A. But please don't feel like you have to hold all your questions until then. Uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel uh, throughout today's session. Uh, feel free to get your questions in early and often. Uh, one of our announcements today, we're excited uh, that we'll be piloting a new Small Area Forecast Working Group in 2022. Uh, the Small Area Forecast is one of the ongoing projects coordinated by the Regional Planning Team here at Dr. Cog, uh, where we model the distribution of jobs and households throughout the region in order to better understand and estimate future travel demand. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if, if you're interested. My contact info is listed here. I'd also like to note that um, the nomination period for our MetroVision Awards is now open. Uh, these awards recognize projects, programs, and plans that help further the region's shared, aspiration, uh, shared aspirational vision for its future. Uh, more information about the nomination criteria can be found at drcog.org awards. And again, please feel free to reach out if you're interested. Uh, Brad Calvert's contact information is interested and please feel free to follow up with him. Also pleased to note that um, today's session, um, thanks to our partnership with APA Colorado, is eligible for uh, one and a half AICP certification maintenance credits for live viewing. Uh, the best way to find the event in APA system is to search for the event number uh, 9226979. And uh, we will be posting our survey link again at the end of today's session, but uh, we would appreciate your feedback uh, when we're through and please let us know how we can improve and sustain uh, this MetroVision Idea Exchange series. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is uh, Libby Tart. Uh, Libby is a senior long range planner for Adams County with over 16 years of local government planning experience. Uh, prior to her work in Adams County, she was a planner for both the cities of Longmont and Aurora. So if you could take it away, Libby. Okay. Hello, Metro Vision Exchange. Um, my name is Libby Tart, and I work for Adams County as their senior long range planner. And over the last 18 months, I, along with two of my colleagues, um, have been hard at work at up, on updating three of our long range master plans, a transportation master plan, a parks, open space and trails plan, and the comprehensive plan. Um, my colleagues, Byron Fanning and Chris Chauvin are on this webinar in case questions arise about transportation or parks master planning. Um, we are happy to be here to provide a little insight into how county master planning works and hopefully to provide some details about how we differ from our other, the other two presentations that you'll be hearing after this. I'm excited to hear what Bennett and Littleton have to say about their growth and the ways in which they process their data. So a little bit of format um, to our presentation. Um, I'm a fan of general outlines, um, but we'll go over a vision statement for Adams County demographics and population projections, county just notes to about county growth, um, value lenses and plan themes for our advancing Adams campaign, the concepts, um, fundamental concepts for the comprehensive plan, and then a little bit of um, a tidbit about virtual and in-person outreach. So, um, I know that Dr. Cog was really interested in the general vision statement of Adams County and our county's vision statement is it's very near and dear to our hearts, but it's to be the most innovative and inclusive county in America for all families and businesses. And so this was at the heart of, of the advancing Adams work that we 
um, that we started preparing back in 2019, 2020. Um, so some of the statistics on Adams County, um, the next two slides will go through some of the data that we're using to understand how our county is growing and how we intend on addressing this growth with our vision statement. Um, we're using the latest data from the State Demographer's Office or 2020 to establish our growth projections. And my work is with the unincorporated population itself of the county, but at the heart of it, um, Adams County is, is growing our incorporated and unincorporated populations at the average rate of 1.5% annually. And we're currently um, at 519,572 people um, for our population as of 2020 and are estimated to grow up to um, 675,444 residents by 2040. Our unincorporated population in um, 2020 indicated that we have 98,785 residents that call Adams County home. And based on this 1.5% annual growth rate, over the last 10 years, we forecast we could grow by as much as 29,636 residents by 2040. So um, a few trends that, that are um, endemic to the Adams County, um, several of our incorporated areas are growing at a higher rate than our average 1.5%. And those are Commerce City, Bennett, um, the areas of Adams County Aurora, and um, the areas of Adams County Thornton. And, um, and those are growing at a rate because of the vacant land and infrastructure um, pieces that they have to intake a growing population. Um, strangely enough, Federal Heights is in there, but um, I, you know that may be due to their population growth um, and not necessarily to um, additional housing unit growth, um, but more of an infill growth. And then the unincorporated population of Adams County in 2020 reflects a very diverse community. Um, we have a larger percentage of our population at 49%, identifying as Hispanic Latino origin of any race, followed by white only at 42.8%, and percentages less than 3% of Black, African American, American Indian, Alaska Native, um, Asian Pacific race alone. Um, so I did want to note that our incorporated areas of Aurora and Commerce City are pretty comparable with this Hispanic Latino origin. Um, and then Thornton follows with 31.9% of their population, population identifying as such. So um, this, this is the interesting tidbit about working for a county <laughs> um, after working for our cities um, more exclusively in my career is the unincorporated portion of Adams County really relies on our districts, um, all of our um, outside districts to, to maintain services and to ensure that the growth of our population is adequate and, and is all of, the, all of the needs are being provided to it. So um, for our water and sanitation, we rely on city, you know, there are some jurisdictional services that are provided in various parts of the unincorporated county. Um, but a lot of metro districts. And then for anybody that lives more on the far eastern part of the county, um, it's well and septic through Tri-County. Um, and we have almost 40, a little over 49 of these. Um, and then our fire districts, we have 10 in all that provide fire services and 12 school districts in all. Um, and one of our key code criteria um, when we accept new development within the unincorporated county is a provision of sufficient water supply for 300 years. And that letter has to be um, penned by the Colorado Division of Water Resources and the, the state engineer. So, um, so just kind of piggybacking on the way that we grow, um, we, we have been formulating a lot of fundamental value lenses throughout the three the three um, master plans for the Advancing Adams campaign. And um, it's, so these are fundamental to um, our processing everything. And they're at the heartbeat of, of the campaign. And the first value is equity, which is defined as a just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. 
And then the second value is sustainability defined as the practice of creating and maintaining conditions to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability to meet the same needs elsewhere or in the future. And then the third value of livability is the sum of factors that add up to a community's quality of life, including the build in natural environments, economic prosperity, social stability and equity, educational opportunities, and cultural entertainment and recreational possibilities. So um, throughout, oh, oh, and I forgot our, our last and very, um, very personal theme is, is cultural heritage. And that's to celebrate the cultural assets of the county um, by preserving historic agriculture, bolstering the agritourism industry, um, improving local food distribution channels and utilizing public art and landscapes as a placemaking tool and, um, and just championing our events um, such as the Adams County Fair and educational outreach programs. So going delving into um, some of the comprehensive plan themes, um, we identified five themes for the comprehensive plan, um, and those involve housing, um, community and housing, determining the best locations for housing growth, policies that support a range of housing options, which is super important to the metro area right now, and tools to protect our residents from displacement. Um, and then sustainability in the natural environment pertains to policies to reduce the impacts on the natural environment, increase landscape connectivity um, between protected lands, increase renewable energy generation, and prepare for natural hazards and disasters. Um, the built environment and connections is to create the best locations for growth and types of connections that will be needed, as well as identifying strategies to reduce barriers to mixed use and TOD, um, set guidelines to increase our walkability and work to build a 20 minute community that I'll delve into in a moment. Um, economic development is to guide economic growth and ensure our economic development sectors are diversified to provide jobs for a spectrum of skill sets amongst the region and to to accelerate policies with brownfield redevelopment and coordinate investment in opportunity zones, agricultural innovations, and support workforce diversity and development. Um, and then going into the transportation master plan themes, um, those are delving into um, innovation and technology and emerging mobility with trends in transit and other um, needs, sustainability, ensuring that we um, our capital improvement projects are sustainable, um, rural roads, ensuring that we own and maintained a good rural road supply with our gravel roads program um, and ensuring the safety um, with, with various points of high crash zones and other assorted things are, main, are addressed. And then the parks, open space and trails plan themes um, are natural diverse park and recreational enhancement, um, natural resource, wildlife and habitat protection, waterway and riparian enhancement, um, agricultural lands and rural character alignment with the comprehensive plan in that sense. Um, part and to increase partnerships, regional coordination and stewardship to, um, to properly utilize monies that and grants that are afforded to us that, that help coordinate the region and connect trails um, and to provide additional recreational trail connections throughout the metro area. Um, so a little bit of the advancing Adams framework. Um, we are using three different concepts with um, the comprehensive plan itself to, um, to build our, our land use framework planning. And these are kind of building blocks for our future land use categories in the, in the land use map update, which are currently in the throes of, um, of, of, of the last, you know, the last piece of our legwork with advancing atoms. Um, so we use transects to show compatible land use adjacencies. Um, the county is so large and so diverse with our land use patterns that it's a helpful framework to understand the characteristics of the county and how various land uses nestle together. 
And then the 20 minute community is a framework to establish how we plan for our livability. Can our residents comfortably get to their community needs and wants within a 20 minute walk or a bike ride? Uh, can we plan for gaps in these community needs with this tool? Um, we, we know inherently that this concept can be widespread amongst a 1,184 square mile county, but these concepts can occur within the Southwest and central portions of our county um, and in areas where, around the townships of Bennett and um, unincorporated Strasburg and, the town, and Henderson, which is closest to our Riverdale Regional Park. Um, and then our third framework is scenario planning. Um, and we've used this as an exercise throughout our public outreach this summer to ask people in person at some of our events and through survey work, how they want the county to grow. So um, three of those options were to stay the course and just kind of continue the normal patterns of development um, to the second one was to create small nodes or town centers where there is more of that walkability and, um, and service provisions in a small kind of township model, or um, C, to create more concentrated nodes um, throughout um, our transit-oriented development areas or particular locations where an urban center approach could be there. So um, this is just a slide kind of depicting um, one of our online surveys and how, um, how that's structured. Um, so a lot of our residents and even those that were taking the survey that didn't identify as residents within the county but were interested, um, most of the preferences were to actually live in more of a township or you know, more of a focus center. And so we've kind of threaded um, various concepts um, in different areas of the, of the county um, under that model. So um, just to, to kind of wrap up a little bit more, um, due to our diverse population and due to the, the lovely um, situation that we're all in with this, um, with the pandemic, um, how have we approached things when our campaign launched in the midst of a pandemic? Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw out some of the some of the pieces that we've done. Um, the first phase of our campaign was really about identifying existing conditions, um, and that occurred from kind of the spring of 2020 to about the spring of 2021 this year. And then we launched into phase two, where we're looking at more of the innovative concepts and um, the future land use mapping. So we are very thankful that a lot of our in-person and um, virtual outreach have, have occurred over the course of phase two, which started in May when, um, when we were all receiving our vaccines and were a little more able to safely assess in-person outreach and visit with the public at major community events in person, um, as well as launching a youth event centered around a bookmark contest with Anything Libraries. Um, and we've used the bookmarks as campaign material um, featuring the artist and, um, and a slogan throughout the summer and early fall events. And we've also flyered at various um, regional events that we've had involving recycling and food distribution. But we had a fork in the road in July and August with our Meet People Where They Are portion of the campaign um, with bilingual outreach. And um, but we were able to pick up the pick up that piece and really, really um, dig into additional outreach services um, over the course of the fall. And we are continuing that thread through January because we've heard so many amazing things in those conversations um, with Promotoras. And so um, the campaign will be wrapping up our work in the spring of 2022 and starting more expansive work, um, digging into housing and neighborhood economic development plans. But we encourage you to look at our website for more of the work on the campaign, or you can always reach out to me. Um, my contact information is listed on your screen. And I really wanna thank Dr. Cog again for inviting us to participate on this exchange.
Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Um, while uh, we're, we're changing sharing screens, um, I'll introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Steve Hubert. Uh, Steve is the Planning and Economic Development Manager for the Town of Bennett. Uh, prior to his work in Bennett, Steve's most recent experience was with the City of Lone Tree from 2008 to 2019, first serving as Community Development Director and then as Deputy City Manager. Uh, he's also been active uh, with us at Dr. Cog, uh, being part of Dr. Cog's uh, last MetroVision Planning Advisory Committee during our last update to MetroVision. So I'll hand it over to Steve. Thanks, Andy. Did my PowerPoint come up? Yes. Good, thanks. Um, when I first got a call, I guess it was an email from Brad Calvert asking if I'd be interested in talking about um, population projections and counting the future, I thought, well, that's pretty boring. <laughs> um, and then I thought, why Bennett? And then I'm more, I thought about it, it was like, we think about this, and this stuff all the time. And I'm going to tell you kind of how we use um, population projections and demographics in Bennett. Um, Libby's uh, um, presentation um, referenced Bennett and the growth, growth rate. Um, and um, I think depending on your role as a planner, whether you're a current planner, long range planner, you're doing infrastructure planning, um, transportation planning, um, urban design kinds of work, you look at demographics a little bit differently. Um, and in Bennett, I mean, uh, the first question is, where is Bennett? Um, we're 30 miles um, east of downtown Denver along I-70. We're 20 miles from Fitzsimmons, which we think is an important connection. And you'll see on the slide here, the Colorado Air and Spaceport is just a few minutes um, just northwest of the town of Bennett. The area in green is our, our uh, incorporated area. And yes, we have a couple of uh, um, almost infamous flag uh, pole annexations that were uh, completed back in the early 2000s. Denver International Airport obviously has a big influence on uh, what's happening in the town of Bennett as well. But I think that the biggest driver is I-70 and the access that we have. Um, the, the, this is a, um, obviously an image from Google Earth that I, found, I think shows even a little bit, bit different perspective of how much undeveloped land, Libby talked about how much undeveloped land there is um, in Adams County and Arapahoe County as well. This is the county line, I-70 corridor here. If you haven't been out on the I-70 corridor recently, uh, especially in the area of Aurora, south of I-70, it's, it's pretty amazing what has happened. And so you'll see just in this image, a lot of vacant land um, that might be available for development. So what's going on in Bennett? Um, when Brad sent an email and maybe it was Andy about the full, small area forecast back in the late spring of 2020, I believe, uh, they sent us some numbers and they said, this is what we think might happen in Bennett um, in the next, uh, 2050 was the target. Um, and I looked at that and we had a conversation and I said, I don't think so. I think it's different than that. And they said, really? And I said, well, maybe we weren't to be sure in the spring of 2020, then everything changed. We currently have nearly 1,000 single family detached lots under, under some form of construction. Either the houses are coming out of the ground and they have closings scheduled or infrastructure is being put in place as we speak. Um, in, other, um, in others, the, the, plat the um, plats have been approved and they're just waiting to break ground. So, that's just in these lighter blue areas. Those are our kind of our current projects in these green areas. We have zoning for several thousand more uh, residential units. And that zoning has been in place for 20 years. And so if you think about, well, why has Bennett all of a sudden making these decisions? Those decisions were made many years ago. Why do we count the future? Why does it matter? 
Um, I think unlike some other jurisdictions, we, we, because of the services we provide, we depend on demographics and population projections in a little bit different way. Um, first is what we call our Capital Asset Inventory Master Plan or CAMP, it's our Capital Improvement Program. We provide water. Uh, and when you provide water, demand and delivery, there's no such thing as level of service C or, or D like, like you might get in, tra in transportation. You have to be able to provide service. It's either yes or no. Our, our water resources, our groundwater, uh, we recycle 100% of our water for outdoor irrigation today. Um, and eventually I think that will all be potable water as well. We do have a contract with the state um, uh, engineer's office for renewable water and are awaiting the news on that. Um, but we also provide wastewater. So we provide those two services that really depend on good uh, population projections. Master transportation plan, we're starting our first um, ever master transportation plan. We just kicked it off. That's where level of service of C or D is. Might be just fine for a while. Um, you, can, you can live with that pain. Again, with water and sewer, you cannot live with that pain. And then also our comprehensive plan and annexation decisions, those kinds of population projections inform that. We just updated our comprehensive plan and I'll show you um, how, we, um, how we took a different look at that in 2021 versus 2015. And then also we count the future because of our economic development. Um, I know some of your planning departments and some of you planners work closely with your economic development people in other or jurisdictions that isn't so close, but I, I would advocate that it should be. Um, but when you're looking at economic development, you're looking at, at demographics a little bit differently. You're looking at population within two miles or three miles or five miles, or maybe more effectively within a 10 minute drive, a 20 minute drive or a 30 minute drive. So we're always looking for those kinds of numbers, different sources in some cases. What does our target, target audience look like? Retailers and, and service providers are looking for age profiles. They're looking at female male ratios, depending on the, the type of their business. Household income, obviously. And then when you get into um, um, trying to attract new uh, employment and primary jobs, we also look at workforce population. However, before you can count the future, you really have to figure out where you are today. And when I got here in August of 2019, we were, we were looking at different numbers as low as current population in Bennett of 2200, um, all the way up to over 3000. I think the DOLA Dr. Cog numbers were kind of in this range and they were you know, reasonable numbers. This was an internal um, estimate that we um, um, thought was a little bit more realistic. Again, once you get at that local level, it's a little bit different um, and, and, and being able to arrive at the right number is just a little bit more challenging. But I think it's important. So 2020 census comes along. Um, I think the number that's out there for Bennett is 2862. I don't know if that will be updated as more numbers come in. Um, we think that's about uh, 400, maybe 400, maybe even 500 today um, short because the 2020 census was conducted in the spring of 2020. Our housing populate, our housing development took off in the spring of 2020. And we added several more um, uh, residential units. How do we, why do we feel good about this number? Because we actually know how many households we have. Uh, again, we're not that big, so we can count. We can actually count rooftops on a map if we had to but we know how many water service accounts we have. And then just using a 2.8 um, persons per household, we think we have a population in 2020 closer to uh, 3,200 and, and more um, even now. Um, so, so what do we do about that? How, how do we, because we're, we're different, we don't really depend on regional, even county level projections. Um, I've always been as a planner, for many reasons, uh, a, a um, advocate of, of the concept of peer communities, looking at communities that have similar demographics and market conditions, similar location to market drivers. That might be I-70, I-25, it might be the DIA in our case. 
It might be the mountains. It might be you know um, uh, ski areas. Whatever those market drivers for growth might be, um, look at those uh, communities that have similar goals and objectives, similar institutional structures. Again, those that provide water and sewer um, have a, a little bit better handle on some of their local demographics than other communities might. And I think that we talked about the challenge uh, that, that uh, depend on others. Excuse me, communities that have similar aspirations um, and communities that have been there and done that and those that are there now and they're doing that, we can learn from them. And I've always thought that this is true, not just for population projections, but design guidelines, zoning ordinances, um, comprehensive plans, how do other peer communities approach things? And that peer, set of peer communities might change depending on what your um, issues are. Um, our peer communities, we think, are because of those things that I mentioned in the earlier bullets, proximity, um, been there, done that, Frederick, Firestone, Decono, Johnstown, Timnath, Fort Lupton, Platteville, Hudson, Lock Bowie, Kingsburg, um, Erie's on the should be on this list. I was just going through some numbers earlier this morning, and I know we looked at Erie a couple of years ago. Um, and they're all, even these are in a little bit different stage. Who would have thought we'd be looking at Kingsburg for, for growth uh, patterns or, or Hudson for that matter? Uh, but we are. Um, and these are this is a map of those. Uh, you can see we're, we're really few, we're kind of an outlier out here on I 70, but this is the last corridor. To, to really start growing along with I-76. These communities in um, I-25, again, they've been there, done that, they're doing it now. Um, so we think it's important to look at those communities just to, for sanity checks. Do the kinds of projections we're making make sense? Did that happen in Frederick? Did that happen in Fort Lupton? Is it happening in Platteville today, et cetera? So, and working with others. And Libby talked about this as well. Even though we provide water and sewer and have a pretty good, um, certainly incentive to have the numbers right, we work with our home builders, school district, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. We probably have a little bit uh, closer relationship with our school district than some other communities do. CORE, formerly IREA, Colorado Natural Gas, Adams County, DOLA, Dr. Cog, um, and, and, and many others. Um, so we sat down and we always sit down with our home builders and talk about the projects. How, how many units do you think you're going to build in 2022 or 2023 or 2024? Again, just to get a sense from the home building industry, what they think the market is. Uh, we temper this, you know, we don't necessarily take everything that they say as, you know, um, um, a solid projection, but it's an important projection because this is where our population comes from. More, I mean, this is what drives our population. New homes, new rooftops, um, um, uh, and that may change, but that's really our current driver. Um, and then Bennett School District, I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Bennett School District, the map on the right, uh, 300 square miles. Um, Bennett, in our comprehensive planning area, we're over in here. We're a very small part of the school district. So we are working with them now on a, an IGA, um, but they have Prosper Farms and, and Sky Ranch that are in Aurora and unincorporated Arapahoe County here. So um, we think it's important if you're gonna build a great community, you need to have great schools, not just from a planning, um, uh, you know, kind of a traditional planning perspective, but also economic development as well. So I was gonna share what we did, but it's not ready for public um, 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 distribution yet. So I just kind of, I, this is how we're approaching it. We're doing project by project on a spreadsheet. We're looking at the status of entitlements. We're looking at the total number of units by unit type. You might know that school districts, you know, estimate a certain student generation based on you know, single family detached versus townhomes or multifamily. We look at the projected cons home construction by year. We also looked at uh, peer communities when we did this. We um, helped the school district create some planning area quadrants. Um, estimate total homes per year, projected student population. And then we ended up with, uh, this isn't what it will eventually look like, but this is the concept of some bubbles that say, you're gonna have to have a high school in this area. You'll need some elementary schools in these areas and fill in the middle with the middle schools. And so th this will, th this is a, something that we're working on today. Um, and then back to our capital asset inventory master plan. 
Everything is GIS based, all of our water, sewer, all of our public improvements um, are in our, our GIS system. Um, and this is not a great animation, it's not animated. Just, um, but you know, these, are, these are growth areas that we expect in, in the near future. Um, and then the, the next phase, the next four or five years uh, looks like this. And then four choice of colors here, but um, even you know, future phases. Um, and so we can, we can track that and we can make adjustments to our population projections. Again, our primary driver is, can we provide water and sewer service to our new residents? This is a 2015 comprehensive plan. And when I came here, I thought, really? <laughs> this was our planning area. We went uh, way west of Watkins and, and uh, it was just this huge area. Uh, and I think that someone had great aspirations at the time, but probably not very realistic, primarily because of the inability to serve. 2021 comprehensive plan, this uh, solid blue line is where we think it's reasonable that Bennett will grow. This is where uh, we're most likely to be able to provide water and sewer uh, services um, and can concentrate that development within uh, this area and even more focused where we take out some properties that are either a solar farm that aren't going to be developed or might be broken up into you know, five acre lots, not likely to develop. develop. Um, and, and so this is our, our new approach to comprehensive planning and, and then a little more focused, again, based on our ability to, to provide services. Then back to the economic development demographics, those numbers are a little bit different because uh, when you're trying to market a, a community of a population of 3,000, no one's really interested. But we knew intuitively that um, our, our market area is what was much larger. And so we actually use cell phone data um, to find out who's shopping at one of our um, major retailers. And it looks like this. And all of a sudden, our market area has a population of you know, 20,000 and an average household income of 108,000. This is, this is a different kind of look. And when we look at population projections based on one single jurisdiction, that's hard enough. It's difficult, but we would love to figure out how we can get a better handle without paying a lot of money for commercial data uh, to figure out uh, what do the demographics look like as they cross uh, jurisdictional boundaries. So we've got Adams County here, we've got Arapahoe County, Obviously, we have Deer Trail is incorporated. These unincorporated communities, Byers, Strasburg. We're looking for data uh, the best we can to piece together this kind of a, a database. So I think that's my last slide. That's how we use demographics and population projections in, um, in Bennett. Um, oh, so how do we count the future? Um, um, are regional or county level growth rates applicable? Maybe, I'm not sure. I think it's more likely that we, we look at peer communities. I'm still an advocate of having a look at low, medium, high growth scenarios. You know, what ifs? Um, are we talking about two, three, 400 Ds per, per year? Probably in that range, 3%, 4.5%, 6%. I think we'll have years that will, will be much higher than this. On the average, this probably works. Just, you know, a few years ago, we pegged our population at 12,500. By 2029 in our capital improvement program, we think we're still pretty close to that. Uh, these projections have to be adjusted over time. And as always, this is a continuous journey. So that is my last slide. Well, thank you. Um, I'll introduce our last speaker. Our last speaker is Kathleen Osher. Uh, Kathleen is the Director of Community Services for the City of Littleton. Uh, prior to her work with Littleton, she was the executive director for Transit Alliance, uh, where uh, she created the Citizens Academy program, which trains emerging leaders to take action, volunteer, and join area leaders in making Denver, uh, the, the, the Denver region, the place to live, work, and play. Um, in 2016, uh, Kathleen uh, was awarded the Distinguished Service Award, um, speaking of uh, Dr. Cog Awards. Um, so take it away, Kathleen. I thought you were going to do a shameless plug for both that, the awards program and the Citizens Academy, now a program of Dr. Cog. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for 
uh, hosting this Metro Vision Idea Exchange, and I'm looking forward to questions, so I'll try and, and get through this. I do feel like I'm today's uh, token non-planner. Um, I am located in the city manager's office, so I'm going to change up our presentation a little bit and give you a big picture view, both of growth management um, and in community engagement and, and really advancing that. With the results of our 2017 municipal election, we started a four year journey in Littleton that recognized in many ways the giant pause that we had taken in terms of big policy initiatives. Um, in many ways, Littleton was this adorable procrastinator that had to kind of don the status of overachiever in an overnight kind of way. Um, so our last sales tax increase was 1970. We were dealing with a land use and zoning code from 1976, and we hadn't updated our comprehensive plan since 1989. So in 2017, we got a very firm commitment, both from our council, our leadership, and our staff to really begin to tackle some of these big big pieces. Um, obviously, with a comprehensive plan from 1989, a few things have changed. A land use code from 1976, many things have changed. In fact, I got tired of answering or listening to the response. That was before I was born. So that became an opportunity to really think about how can you start a process when you've taken this long a time out? So it became very important to create that emotional connection for people, be very intentional about each step and be very values-based to get people on the same page. We also had to give our elected officials a lot of confidence. So measuring engagement and making sure that they understood um, our commitment to it being a community driven process, but also the importance of enough information for them to make informed decisions. So that emotional connection in many ways started with a long list of shared values, uh, not doing this work and having a very tumultuous 2010s sort of decade in Littleton meant that many people didn't think that we agreed on much. So really capturing the hearts and minds to make sure that people understand we have more in common than what sets us apart. I think one of the trade-offs that we did have to accommodate was that we couldn't really ask a lot of leading questions. We really did have to go out into the community and be very, very good listeners and just take a giant notebook of making notes and making sure that people understood this was a conversation. So we started in 2018 with a unifying vision exercise. We spent eight months on this. We had conversations about what would it take? What do you value uh, to continue to grow the Littleton way and recognize the incredible community character, uh, historic preservation and historic assets throughout the city. We also heard lots about transportation. You know, that's the most popular backyard barbecue conversation is about traffic in the metro region prior to uh, COVID and our experience of, of working from home. But in many ways, it was that emotional connection so that we could demonstrate our listening skills and set the stage for a modern land use and zoning code, addressing some of the revenue needs of the city and continuing an ongoing dialogue to accomplish some of the other big needs in the city. So the great input from our community was absolutely essential. We did try and quantify everything. So you can see that graphic, it's on my left. Um, so that became an opportunity for us to think through how can we, and we were incredibly blessed of doing this in 2019 prior to a global pandemic. So it was a combination of 261 events of being out in the community, constantly just being everywhere, listening and having over 8,300 conversations with individuals. Um, and also, you know, as part of small groups, doing things like having a community dinner with people that are in low income, income housing, bringing some pizzas, having a conversation about what they were seeing and experiencing, engaging our religious communities and others. Um, I did enjoy Libby saying bookmark because that was a great tool for us too. It became sort of our signature calling card and a great uh, way to continue to promote the, our, our local library as well. So why start with, you know, when you've taken such a large time out, why start with the comprehensive plan? Why start with a unifying vision? It was really an opportunity for us as a city to better define the challenges that we were up against. And 
ultimately be a partner that could sit at regional and local tables and clearly articulate what we were working towards, what we wanted to see happen in the future. I will say not having a comprehensive plan since 1989, oftentimes that put the city in the position of sitting around the table and someone would say, well, what do you want, Littleton? And Littleton would say, uh, I don't know, something good. Can you give us something good? So that opportunity to guide internal decision making and really create lasting change over time. It's a really incredible journey and trajectory led very strongly by a very intentional city manager in Mark Ralph establishing this political focus and discipline through two-year council work plans, uh, creating a, a tool called priority-based budgeting, really demonstrating that we support the things that are valued in the community. Again, getting that unifying vision. Was it visionary? It's questionable, but did it bring people together and really create that opportunity for um, us to understand that people agree on more than they don't. The comprehensive plan, creating tools like a leadership framework to show the cyclical nature and cadence of being able to create very lasting policy change, tackling things like organizational culture, unfortunately, during a global pandemic, and then ultimately setting the stage and um, our just recently passed unified land use code in October of 2021. Um, so October 19th, we also were successful in November um, with a very positive result in terms of our municipal election and our current council, but also a yes on 3A, which is a 0.75 sales tax increase. The pieces that were important during the process is that Again, that intentionality and focus was so important. That connection constantly to the strategic vision of where we were heading and a four-year journey, uh, but we had to be tact tactically flexible, right? We had to think about things a little bit differently. We were working with very accelerated timelines. Um, we were trying to clip these things off very, very aggressively. So a unifying vision that began in May of 2018 in front of council for adoption in December of 2018. A comprehensive plan that begins there shortly after uses all of that input from the community, continues to gather additional input in front of council in October of 2019. And then beginning our unified land use code in 20. 20 in February, and then having to mitigate all of the impacts, both with outreach and otherwise, throughout the global pandemic to then have it adopted by council in October 2019. So multi-year, multi-milestone, some of the things that were really important um, when you think about the first phase of our, our work, you got to have a clear understanding among you, the community of where we are. What's the existing city look like? Because you haven't had that conversation since 1989. A lot has changed. A lot changed through the 90s and early 2000s. So we said, you know, an existing city's report, probably not as meaningful as a data book full of a series of different factoids and information. We also had engaged um, some leaders throughout the region in a four-part speaker series to come to our community. These were mostly evening events, a, a few morning events as well, but we had a four-part speaker series beginning with the state demographer's office to really set the stage for, for growth and what was happening. And then um, great leaders like the former city manager of Fort Collins to talk about how you create lasting meaningful policy change and, and so on. So this became an exercise in really uh, creating some muscle memory of how you walk through good governance, again, that lasting policy change, but setting the stage and constantly going through these phases of saying, are we ready for the next step? And um, again, with a very accelerated timeline. The most important deliverable as part of the comprehensive plan was to begin to map out what the future city would look like. This was all about growth management, but unlike my colleagues that have presented today, we are a mostly built out. In many ways, I, I heard from the community that one of the most popular public works projects would be if we could dig a moat and then have a drawbridge and maybe let it down once a day, but that's not a realistic project. We don't live in an island. We're seeing growth happen all around us, but we as a city are mostly, growth, mostly built out. So how do we accommodate that? 
And really the emphasis became on how can we focus on our corridors for reinvestment, particularly Santa Fe and Broadway? How can we look at corridors like Bellevue and Littleton Boulevard and create some opportunities? We introduced economic models both for specific projects, but then also modeling the long-term fiscal health relative to land use and land use decisions and making a very, very strong connection to transportation. Much of our success with the outreach during the comprehensive plan is because we were doing a transportation master plan at the same time. And in many ways, it's easier to engage a community about things like transportation than it is on land use. Land use is a little bit more complicated. Transportation is something that people really relate to. And so you can have, you can start the conversation there and then really broaden their understanding. Uh, but much of this work was with the understanding that we're creating a path towards, again, that good governance piece of regularly updating this future city and look towards the future with a comprehensive plan again being in front of council in 2025. Littleton is no stranger to growth. Uh, we saw 304% increase in growth in uh, the late 50s and early 60s. Um, you know, obviously our percentage has um, decreased dramatically from there. We saw the influx of coastal families from both the East and West Coast coming to Littleton for very high paying jobs. It really set an incredible um, pathway and, and forward journey for the city because we had so many incredible civic leaders then coming with some grand ideas and a lot of time and energy to support the future growth of Littleton. Again, the comprehensive plan was an exercise in really doing, really doing that listening. So a big set of ears out and a very large notebook with a nice pen that never runs out of ink or a pencil, if you will. But one of the most important pieces for both our council and our community was to show that if we hear something from you, you can find it in every document that we're creating. So we get the input first, and then we embed that in the set of core values. You know, So this was a direct quote from someone, Littleton's a great city to live in. It has a nice small town feel, great amenities, including parks and local shops. I will say that we heard the small town feel a lot. Our consultant would always say, you know, you're a town of like 40, six 48,000 people, we hear small town feel in 250,000 population towns as well. So really trying to quantify what that is and then translating that into a guiding principle. And then ultimately in the comprehensive plan, the goals that we identified were directly from those community conversations. So being able to show that in the document then policy direction directly from our city council. I got the distinct privilege of being their nighttime reader during one of their study sessions where I got to read each and every policy statement and then they got to react it, to it and discuss it. And then the last piece, those action steps that then staff and the organization of the city can take and uh, usher in as part of that. Our comprehensive plan was focused on community character. And we really tried to focus that on the physical attributes of the city. Oftentimes that community character got used in a different way um, during conversations, particularly as we got more and more detailed about our unified land use code. But we used this sort of pie chart concept, you know, with the three, the pie being divided up into three parts, pavement, open space buildings. And you can kind of see as, you know, from rural over to urban, how the, the pie gets divvied up. But it became an important tool to both set the foundation for in the comprehensive plan and speak to various parts of the future city in terms of this pie chart, but then also um, setting the stage again for updating our land use and zoning code. That connection with transportation was so, so critical, it, not only in terms of how we were engaging the community, but also because the city had never had a transportation master plan. So this was their first ever, and it became an opportunity to really think about a classification system that was much more context sensitive and set a stage for level of service policy, introducing a philosophy and almost methodology for the city and conversation about how would we treat things like transit and bicycle and pedestrian networks in, in um, lockstep with how we were already accustomed to 
to our efforts um, for auto-oriented type transportation. Uh, that's a big leap after not having had that conversation as part of the conference plan in 1989. It was really a focus on land use and complete networks. Unlike some cities that explore things like complete streets where every mode is sort of represented, we knew that in our suburban context, it became important to think about how to each of those um, opportunities to travel around the city exist within a network and they, that they crisscross both east and west and north and south to get people to um, their services, jobs, and, and other needs. We began a process to identify critical corridors again, which really uh, set the stage for how and what the land use and particularly on the zoning side that could look like for all of those corridors in the city. Obviously, when you start talking about things like transit and bicycles, everyone thinks you're going to, you know, suddenly put the car on this incredible diet and, you know, make it go away. Uh, so it was very important as part of that community conversation to, to demonstrate, you know, much of our work as a city and our transportation investments were still very auto oriented, but it was an opportunity to begin to in, and advance a philosophy around active transportation and create some opportunities. Um, you know, for something like transit, what the most important thing that transit needs is really great land use. And so that became an important uh, nexus and, and synergy that we had to demonstrate to the community and continue to, to bring them along in terms of what we were seeing with the future city and projecting out to 2040. So, since then, I get this moment to be a little retrospective. So again, a unifying vision that we spent about eight months on adopted in 2018, a comprehensive plan adopted in October of 2019. And then we were able to get things like a new sales tax in 2021, a unified land use code in 2021. We've had uh, our first ever directly elected mayor in quite some time. We have three new council members, an incredible infusion of money into our capital fund, which just puts us in a completely different situation with a 58.9% yes vote on 3A, which is amazing. Um, our comprehensive plan sets the stage for all of these new partnerships. And again, the city sitting at the table being very clear about what it needs and what it wants to see happen with a lot of community input to feel very confident that we're on the same page with our neighborhoods and other key stakeholders in the city. And you know, with the corridors creating a path to mixed use. So it's been a really interesting and um, incredible journey. So I would love to answer some questions and turn it back over to Andy to get us started with that. All right, I think we've got some more slides coming up here uh, just to remind you uh, to use the Q&A uh, portion uh, of the control panel um, to ask questions. Um, I think we've already got one, but I'm just going to take this opportunity to moderate this and, and rephrase some of these questions as well. And, and, and I've got some for myself um, using moderator's prerogative, I guess. Um, so the, the first one that we got in uh, to the Q&A section, um, I think relates back to Libby, you mentioned the 300 year look ahead uh, and for sufficient water supply, but most of our plans don't really look forward that far or even a fraction of that long. How can we factor that perspective into some of our plans? And, and I think anyone on the panel can, can answer that question if you've got some thoughts. Sure. So, so that is um, part of our development standards and regulations subdivision code. Um, and I believe that there are quite a few metro jurisdictions that follow the same sort of either 200 or 300 year threshold for um, supplying, uh, proving that you have adequate water supply for your development. Um, from our perspective, it, you know, the state, it, the state is 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 very resolute um, when they do their reviews of our water supply um, with senior water rights, in particular usurping junior water rights and ensuring that um, if there are 
differing kinds of junior water rights that um, that there are particular engineering specifications in, in place. But I I I am not a water engineer <laughs> um, and don't play one on TV. But um, but I you know it is one of those things where we have seen some development applications come up um, over the last few years where they have really had to had to um, go back in and and prove additional adequacies in order to get that letter from our state engineer. Andy, I can I'll, I'll take a crack at that as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't want to get into a debate here, but I do think it's dangerous sometimes to depend on technology to work yourself out of a problem. But I do think in terms of water, I think the concept of toilet to tap, like it or not, is there. Castle Rock's exploring it. We are so close. If a town the size of Bennett can do it, we are almost potable. I think we'll be potable in five years. Um, we are using it now for outdoor irrigation. We are, as we speak, extending our what we call purple pipe system. Uh, that's recycled water uh, for outdoor irrigation for common areas, parks. Um, as well as one home builder, at least now, um, considering uh, using it for single family outdoor irrigation. So it's that clean, um, it's that advanced. That doesn't mean the problem is solved, but I think that's a big part of the solution. Thanks. Um, this question I'm gonna use to, to launch off of that, just I'm curious about um, how you talk about uncertainty with your residents. How do you navigate planning for growth when there's always uncertainty um, around these projections? I'll weigh in. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. Um, as part of the, the comprehensive plan, looking at our growth trends, looking at particularly the impact on the long term fiscal health of the city, what we found based on what our normal trend for population growth would be is that to accommodate that growth, we would need 6,550 new housing units, which caused a lot of conversation. Because even with the growth, I think for many of our residents, particularly not having this regular conversation and maybe not fully appreciating how much was changing in the region, many of them said, we don't have to say yes to that. We don't have to grow. And so it became an opportunity for us to, to work again with the state demographer's office and introduce some of that, like we're not alone in this, we're seeing the growth elsewhere. Um, one of our biggest challenges as a city is the pressure to the south that, that, that creates with the growth in Douglas County on our transportation networks. And so as that traffic pushes through, is there an opportunity to create jobs and housing that mean people don't have to commute through, they actually originate in Littleton. And so if traffic is one of your biggest concerns, then maybe growth is um, something that we need to think about and manage in a way that still preserves what people find most important about Littleton's community character. Andy, I'll respond. Um, if you think our residents are concerned about the uncertainty, know that we are as well. Um, and we're providing the water and sewer services in our case, right? We've got to get it right. Um, and I think to do that, you have to be flexible. I mean, you don't overextend yourself. You don't, you don't invest in, in uh, based on, on the most aggressive, you know, high, high, uh, um, high uh, growth scenario. You don't, um, on, on the other hand, you don't keep yourself short by saying, well, we're not gonna grow very fast and therefore we don't have to build much of a system. I think you have to be flexible and move with that demand. That may mean, you mean if, and I think so there's some cities and towns up and down the front range who've had the experience where they had, they had a lull because they, they got, they got, I won't say caught, but they didn't, they didn't have what they thought they were gonna have. And so they had to slow down. Um, and, and then they fix that problem and, and they pick it up again. Um, but I, I do think you have to be diligent and I think you have to consider um, different kinds of growth management uh, if and when those tools are, are required. 
And I'll, I'll piggyback on that, Andy, too. Um, I, you know, even though I don't have any mapping or um, things, concepts to show on paper right now, um, those scenario planning exercises where we were asking our community um, whether or not they want to grow with town centers or if they want to grow with urban centers, we certainly got a lot of feedback from our residents um, about increasing an, an amount of town centers so that we concentrate a little bit more of those townhomes, those other types of products that are not traditionally seen as, as, as much in Adams County, in the unincorporated portions of Adams County. Um, but having that be a walkable, habitable environment um, so that the footprint's a little bit smaller in terms of the way that the growth occurs and that it's around sufficient services um, and sufficient infrastructure to handle that growth. Um, we also got the approach um, to, um, to kind of lead the charge around some of our TOD areas as well. So we do have a Pecos and a federal station that are definitely um, have more vacant land um, where we could densify and grow more of a, a of a 20 an 18 to 24 hour um, exciting node of 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 um, of a community there. So um, that those are a couple of solutions to how we can grow the community with the 29,000 people that we're projecting by 2040. Thanks. Um, just remind folks if you've got questions, feel free to put them in the the Q and A section. Um, I'm going to try and uh, do the second part of the the first question that we already got in, um, and it, it I think it expresses some concerns about the sustainability uh, of projected growth and um, what sometimes comes across as anti-growth sentiment. How do you deal with with that in terms of of planning and and what messages about growth really work well to engage residents in the planning process despite those concerns? I would share from our experience here or in Littleton is that, um, you know, in many ways, because we couldn't ask a lot of those leading questions, uh, the environmental stewardship and even sustainability, I think we're living as a given for, for much of our community. They didn't really elevate to the top. There wasn't sort of a, a pain point of how often they were brought up. I can remember answering questions from our city council during study sessions of where's, where's environmentalism, where's sustainability? And I said, we're just not hearing about those things. Um, but again, if you, as we think forward to 2025, um, council, our city council now has a goal as part of their two-year work plan directly related to that environmental stewardship and sustainability. And we're embedding pieces, you know, that just was not a thought process in 1976 for land use and zoning codes. Um, so embedding those sustainability practices into how we're regulating land use and zoning, and then also thinking through those opportunities from a transportation standpoint. But I would say we feel a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of having that conversation because of letting things lie for a while but it is one that is naturally starting to occur and we're continuing to sort of foster both a dialogue and conversation. So I think in our 2025 update, I would expect to see a much more um, thought out and elaborate set of goals and um, policy statements from council. Andy, I think you know this is obviously an issue that we've struggled with throughout the state, the entire state, and, and certainly up and down the Front Range, and to a less, to a different extent, on the Eastern Plains, where they would like you know, more growth. But I think, you know, you know Governor Lamb put a, a stake in the heart of I seventy I I four seventy, which was going to be funded by interstate, you know, federal funds, and because he thought it would just. Um, it would be it would um, spur um, sprawl. Uh, the sprawl happened anyway. Um, I guess my point is, unless there's some overall state level or front range policy position that we're not going to grow, 
then I think we have to figure out how can we accommodate it in a reasonable manner. Um, when we, your, your question talked about when, when we have residents who uh, complain about growth, we do. Some people do not want it to change. They don't want any more, that's it, no more. Others, when we hear that sentiment, we can talk to them about what growth brings. In our case, it might bring another sit down restaurant. I mean, these, are, these are basic kinds of uh, community uh, assets that, oh yeah, it would be nice. It'd be nice to have a, a medical clinic here, wouldn't it? It would be nice to have a, a primary care physician in Bennett. That will happen as rooftops you know, come, then we can start doing those things. It would be great if we could improve our parks. It would be great if we had better um, you know, trail connections. We can do that if we have money that growth brings. Again, not being Pollyannish about this. All growth is not good necessarily, but I do think good growth can, can, can result in good communities. And that's our responsibility, right? I think Mr. Sutton, I, I think he asked several great questions, uh, questions that we've been struggling with for many, many years up and down the front range, but we do have a responsibility um, to, to, to do it the right way or a right way. And I, I was just gonna say, you know, the influences from our districts do create an additional something for the county and our limitations in terms of how we grow, but we do wanna grow thoughtfully. And because we are a, a few vastly different geographies over the 1184 square miles that we have, um, we do see density as being more of the growth tool um, from our perspective because of sufficiencies with, with those districts. Um, so, and, and provisional services that are based on that. We also really wish to emphasize the agrarian nature of our county and how we, we really want to promote and continue the growth of of our agricultural services. And, and we don't want those lands to go away. Um, we don't want the water rights to go away with the land. Um, so there are some programming elements that we have at the county um, where we have an IGA in place with the city of Brighton to preserve 1100 acres called Historic Splendid Valley between the two of our jurisdictions. Um, so there are some sustainability pieces that we have in place that we want to build on and create um, create more of that, the sufficiencies that we need within the state to be a sustainable Colorado. Well, thanks. Um, I've got a, a technical question, I think for Kathleen, there was a pie chart that showed um, all potential projects um, that was based on the budget amount or lane miles covered and they were interested in what the metric was used to derive the percentages. I might've missed yeah. that part. <laughs> so uh, this would be in our transportation master plan. So it is based on the projected budget for each of those projects. And again, a tool for us to say, um, just because we're talking about bikes and pedestrians does not mean that suddenly we're not supporting both safety improvements and even in some cases capacity improvements. What that pie chart does not include are the regionally significant projects. So, you know, the slice of transit is very small. Um, we definitely as a city have an interest in the continuation of fast tracks, the extension of light rail in the south along the southwest corridor, as well as potential investments in bus rapid transit, particularly along the Broadway corridor. So the that sliver of transit doesn't really include those regionally significant pieces, but it is based on what we think the sort of initial costs of a project might be and how how those sort of lay out among the different modes. And I've got a, a question from one of my team members um, that uh, um, I think comes out of uh, uh, some of that as well. Um, for you, Kathleen, how dependent is your ability to advocate for growth as part of your plan dependent on these corridors are reliant or contingent on some of that external investment um, in those corridors. Right, this gets real when you do a land use and zoning code after letting it sit since 1976. So um, 
you know, we started the process. Council was very um, concerned about what we were seeing in our historic downtown. Um, so they took a very strong stance of really mitigating growth and density in some ways in downtown. Um, so suddenly five-story buildings were skyscrapers and, and the conversation became very tense about both density, height, you know, the things that you would normally experience. Uh, I think as part of that process, what came out of it was a new downtown historic district that was just adopted at the end of October and became an all-inclusive district. So that was one tool. And then the other piece was that for many of them, it became in downtown, we have to take this stance, but that means growth has to go somewhere else. So we'll support more density and we'll support greater heights along the corridors. Uh, the city doesn't own a single scrap of land along Broadway or Santa Fe or Littleton Boulevard or Bellevue. So we are incredibly reliant then on setting up a path to mixed use and engaging private investment to help realize this goal. It is what we hope with the unified land use code is that we've made it so clear, you know, like, is it, are we being consistent? because that's the biggest thing they're gonna ask for, right? Like, I just want a consistent process that I can understand. Is it as simple as it can be? I mean, land use codes are not known for their simplicity, but we've tried to make it as simple as possible. And then does, you know, can we clearly articulate through these projects a community benefit? And so we, you know, much like what Steve was talking about, the opportunity to have some of those additional amenities. When we look at the Southern part of Broadway with the new development of Littleton Village, the thing they would most like there is a grocery store. And so how do you spur that sort of commercial development? You have to have the rooftops. Um, and also using our economic modeling to say, very clearly going into particularly this year's election, we don't have a land use revenue problem in terms of our fiscal health. We actually have a revenue revenue problem. So let's tackle that and let's understand that it's not as simple as residential costs us money and commercial makes us money. It's way more complex than that and understanding how that, that plays out. Um, we did have a decision of 4-3 on our seven-person city council to now allow for residential and hotel at our Aspen Grove um, shopping lifestyle center. So that's, that's an incredible opportunity for us to demonstrate how retail may now be evolving into more of a right size mentality, you know, that it's not just about big square footage necessarily, but that right-sized high-performing retail and then mixing in those rooftops to really support it. I think that that will be um, in many ways a case study to kind of further evolve that thinking in the city as well. So it sounds like there's lots of uh, appetite for, for growth still on those corridors, even without some major investments because there is yeah. existing infrastructure. Right. Well, and, you know, at the at the end of the day, we may be the winner of the most abandoned Safeways of, of anywhere in the region, you know, that smaller scale Safeway format. Um, so we just have a lot of underperforming strip centers, re retail centers that are ripe for redevelopment, but we just didn't have the land use code that that spurred any sort of interest from private investment. So that's where we and we hear that. I mean, in our resident and business surveys, one of the number one things we hear is what's going on with over there, right? Like it looks abandoned. It looks terrible. It's not, you know, the great gateway into what is an amazing city. Why can't we do something there? Can't we make something happen there? Thanks. Um, I've got another question here. Um, as a planner at a jurisdiction in the Denver metro area interested in these topics, um, how can I get involved in the work that Dr. Cog is doing to forecast where and how our community and region will grow? Um, I, I guess this might be a question for me, but um, I, I'm also curious um, for the panel's perspective on, on what more um, um, us as Dr. Cog staff could do to help uh, engage and sustain this conversation around growth. Um, I mentioned uh, in the announcements, um, we're, we're piloting uh, a working group um, to try and sustain this conversation. 
in the past, we've typically done our work, our forecasting work, and then presented the results and, and gotten comment um, from local jurisdiction staff. But we want to make sure we're also talking about some of the bigger trends. Um, so I'm kind of I'm interested from, from you as the panel of what kind of appetite you have for for understanding um, our staff's perspective and the data and the other things that we're looking at. Like how how can we help? Um, I'll I'll start in kind of a selfish way. Um, the, the data is absolutely important as in my presentation in, in so many different ways. And we sometimes struggle, um, especially you know, when you're towards the end of a of a census, 10-year census period, you're at 2018, 2019, and you get the kind of numbers that we that we were facing. Um, and then we start depending on uh, commercial sources for data, uh, whether it's Esri or 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 um, uh, CoStar or whatever, and they're out there, and some of them are actually pretty good. We, we were really we, I mean, we get cell phone data. It's kind of scary that what we get, but we get cell phone data um, that doesn't really give us population number, but it gives all, us a whole lot of uh, demographics and, and, and location. So. To the extent that Dr. Cog or the state, and I know that Elizabeth Garner, I think she may have left, but top-notch dem demographer, if there ever was one. Um, but um, if we could get some of that kind of cross-jurisdictional data that would help us understand what's going on in our in our communities, and and Bennett's a great example. We've got Bennett in our our municipal boundaries, but we've got Adams County and we've got Arapahoe County. And what's happening around us? And how do we how do we get really good kind of localized data on what's happening around us? So getting more refined data, regardless of jurisdictional boundaries, I think would be a great help. Other than that, I think continuing the conversation is 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 key. And, and kudos to Dr. Cog uh, for for this whole concept of idea exchange. I mean, we we learn best when we learn from others, right? I would echo all of that from, from Steve. Um, I do think also just the opportunity to really understand where there are some peer experiences, right? So our peer cities look very, very different from, from Steve's, for example. I think we also get some questions from our elected officials about, are they really a peer for us? You know, And I watch cities like a, a Wheat Ridge, for example, because in many ways, it's a similar pattern that I'm seeing, both um, just sort of the changes in their city council, uh, their appetite for how they are advancing new development in what is a mostly built out city and absorbing some population growth, seeing some change in um, the demographics, particularly on the age front. I mean, we skew much older as a city. We're median age of like 42. Um, but I, I think, you know, that and then the, the growth piece and where its nexus is with economic development, I really applaud, you know, the recent Metro Vision exercises and how they have taken that into account and blended in both economic development and, and economic forecasting. Um, and, and obviously the big struggle that we're all gonna be facing and your efforts on you know, inclusionary housing and affordable housing as, as an agency and, and how we, we all start to grapple with that, both affordable and attainable housing. I think all of those are part and parcel to this bigger piece. So it's just constantly embedding that growth management um, and that growth message as part of each of those sort of disparate yet connected efforts. Thanks, I think we've got a good model for, for a lot of this work um, with Vision itself, uh, with these idea exchanges, and we always try and get a good mix of communities so it's not just one type of peer out there. Um, and uh, we even have some good um, uh, models for how we do some shared data purchasing and, and ways that we can um, make it so that everyone doesn't have to buy the same thing, um, that there's some ways that we can get some value in numbers. So I think there's some things we can we can take away from some of those answers um, about our work. Um, 
I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about aging, um, since that did just come up. Um, just how, how do you uh, factor in some of the changing demographics that, that places like the, the State Demography Office forecasts and that, that I know we as Dr. Cog staff often talk about because we have the area agency on aging as part of our organization. How, how, how does that factor into to some of your discussions about growth? So at a very local level, um, we just we just know that that's a gap in our housing supply, um, and um, I, I think the community would be supportive. And again, we're again we're you know 3,200 people, we just don't have that many bodies, um, and we have an aging population. We have a, a relatively significant um, a lower income population as well. We have a lot of mobile homes. We have we're one of the few communities that have mobile home zoning. Um, and want to keep it um, as opposed to get rid of it. And so, yeah, I think the, the only thing that tells us is what we kind of already know that there's a demand and we want to position and, and think about incentive programs and what we can do to incentivize um, you know, senior housing um, as well as, as, as programs. And those are the kinds of things that we can work with Adams County on and a lot of their social services related kinds of programs as well as Arapahoe County. Um, so, yeah, yeah and I, I was going to say, like, uh, I will say that that was a constant theme that we were hearing, particularly from stakeholders like the realtors. Um, people really fell in love with Littleton. It surprised me how many of them weren't actually like born in Littleton because, man, they act like they were. <laughs> um, but, you know, they came in, in the 50s and 60s as part of a, a job with either what became Lockheed Martin or um, Marathon Oil. And so they just really fell in love with this place and don't want to leave it. And there's not many options for where they can go um, in terms of their housing choices. So we think that's an opportunity along the corridors. It's interesting, though, with you know, arguably our most dense development has happened in downtown uh, and it skews about 10 years younger. So it's an opportunity also to attract sort of that next generation. I will say the number of people that um, have tried to come back is a pretty consistent theme, right? Like I grew up in Littleton. I tried to find a house. Most realtors will tell them, maybe you want to look a little south, maybe in the Highlands Ranch, just get your first home and then and then come back, right? And, and I'll keep looking for you. Um, but it is a very, very competitive market. So we know that those 6,550 units where we're um, struggling on, on all fronts. And I think region-wide is what that missing middle looks like because you've got the single family home or you've got the tower of multifamily and sort of nothing in between. And it does feel like an idea of building sort of a multiplex with you know six to eight units sort of nestled in between is something that could fit very nicely in terms of character. You know, suddenly roof pitch becomes super important in a city like Littleton. So being able to create something that has those physical attributes, but includes multiple choices for, for people for living, um, those are huge opportunities. And I, we, we don't have quite the same um, demographic. So I'll, I'll just speak to um, kind of um, some of our multi-generational needs. So we, we have heard a lot from our, our population about um, we have a large piece of property and can, you know, and we don't have a, a size, a right sized house to accommodate the couple of extra generations of our kiddos that are coming back and living with us or bringing their whole families back. And, and wanting to live with us. So we've, we've tried to address that through um, allowing um, accessory dwelling units and a variety of other things um, in our agricultural zones and in our single family detached zones so that we can create some opportunities for missing middle housing, some multi-generational housing that still works, um, whether or not it works for, you know, for the 2040 seniors, of which I'll be one of those, um, or or what you know, or other um, generations, um, they may flip out, flip 
and switch out the types of housing that they build um, under these ADUs. But those are those are some possibilities that we've really been trying to incentivize at Adams County. Well, we're just about at time. I really want to thank you uh, all for for speaking and, and sharing uh, on the panel today, and ask and and leaving lots of time for for some really good questions. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, we'd appreciate your feedback on our survey um, uh, through SurveyMonkey. Um, I think we can drop it in the chat. It might be there already, uh, but but please feel free um, to provide us some feedback, ideas for topics, that kind of thing. But um, I don't want to keep anyone any longer, so I just want to say uh, thank you again. Thank you for attending, and thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, everyone.